Uh, what a joy to be with you. Uh, we are staying at the Holland Hotel. Uh, there will be vacancies after we leave if you're interested in moving in after us. Uh, we are very grateful for uh, Ralph and Donna Holland. They serve as oversight ministry for our church in Raleigh, uh, Celebration Church. And uh, if you get bored with my message, you can actually listen live to one of my associates preaching today. He did a pretty good job, if you'd like to catch that halfway through my message. Um, no, but uh, we, I have to just tag on this uh, uh, congratulations to Tim and Abigail for such a wonderful uh, leadership team that they represent um, as a couple, but also being the senior leaders of this house. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the church is so reflective of their character and their quality, and uh, we love them and appreciate them and, and value them. Uh, and I'm glad to be with all y'all today, and I'm glad that I could get to say that in my Australian-American Texas ease, and um, uh, great to see familiar friends and, and faces that uh, we love so dear, and uh, we're glad to be with you. Last night was wonderful. We had a, we had a wonderful night uh, at the Valentine banquet, and uh, so this morning, though, I feel like I have an assignment from the Lord to share a word with you. If you please turn to, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and just the first verse as a beginning place, Turn there while I pray. The Bible says, watch and pray, so you can keep your eyes open while you turn there, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. As it goes forth today, let it touch every heart that is in this house, who's watching by, uh, by your, uh, online, and I thank you that you will accomplish what you please. In Jesus' name, amen. Judy mentioned something uh, unscripted. Uh, we didn't talk about what she was going to talk about, uh, but she just really set things up quite nicely for me today in talking about uh, this multiplication thing. I, I want you to look at this verse because this verse speaks of the progressive nature of the kingdom of God. Look at this. He's, the Lord is speaking, saying, every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. Now watch these words. That you may live. Everyone say live. And multiply. Say multiply. And go in. Say go in. And possess. Say possess. Isn't that interesting? He said, I don't want you just to live, but I want you to multiply. And then with your multiplication, that you make progress to go into something and to possess something. The purposes of us being on earth is not just to take up human space, to be born, to go to school, have some sort of education experience in a college environment, or not, get a job, get married, have children, so get some money for your latter years and then die and go to heaven. If that's all there is to this, then it's not particularly fulfilling. And, but for a lot of people who don't know the Lord and who don't understand about the kingdom of God, for many people, that's all they think it is. Live a few years, accumulate a few things. But the nature of the kingdom of God is always a forward motion. It's always taking us progressively from where we are to where He wants us to be. That's why we live life with intention and with purpose. We know the, the scripture Isaiah very well. I know the plans that you have for me, says the Lord. I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope and a future. God is already in your future, kind of waiting on you to get over your past so you can hurry up and catch up with Him in your future. You see... That's why I love teaching children sometimes more than adults because children are very teachable. But all that adults are really is just older children trying to get over their childhood. <laughs> so if we can teach children how to have a successful childhood, they'll have a successful adulthood, and then maybe we can start a generation of, of people that have never known sin. How about that? That's why children's ministry is important. I mean, that, that's, that's good preaching, Pastor Lynn. Well, thank you. That, that's very good. Yeah, I, I received that. Um, so I kind of got stuck on this multiplication thing. And as you look through Scripture, and Judy mentioned one, about the multiplication that took place when Jesus took the simplicity of the loaves and fishes, and from the blessing, the breaking, it multiplied in their very hands. And there's numerous examples of things through Scripture that, that multiplied. Um, I, I missed my first cue, didn't I? That's all right. I, I've got to try this. Oh, oh, hang on, not ready for that. Is that it? Okay, I didn't miss my first cue. All right, let me put, let me get this, this I'm new at this, guys, I'm a, I'm a novice. 
All right, we're back into the praise and worship now. This is great. <laughs> help me out. <laughs> I was so close to success. So while you think, just help me get to the, to the first point. Um, so I, I kind of got this little multiplication thing going in my heart for you today, but not just ordinary multiplication. I feel like part of the word of the Lord I want to give you today is talking about extreme multiplication. How many of you could do with some extreme multiplication in your life? You see, when you hang around average long enough, you will get tired of what mediocre offers. After a while, you have to have a discontent in your spirit to say, God, you have more for me than where I'm at. I've been at average long enough. You know what the word mediocre, by definition, actually means? It means to only go halfway up the mountain. And for a lot of people, they settle for only halfway because to go any further, if you use the building, uh, climbing analogy, the air gets thinner and it gets more dangerous the higher you go in the mountain. And so here we are at a place now of saying, yep, I'm tired of status quo. How can I press towards that other level, that kind of extreme level? So I, I just want to tell some stories today, uh, Bible stories, obviously, um, about three examples of, of extreme multiplication. Uh, the first one is about oil that would not stop flowing. That's, yeah, click. Uh, yeah, good. Don't worry, I'll help you out, Pastor Tim. Uh, uh, oil that wouldn't stop flowing. Now, we know this, uh, of the story from uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 of the widow who had a debt she could not pay and was about to cost her her sons. And the prophet Elisha told her what to do. It was to, to take, because uh, he, he made some bread and oil for her and, uh, and, and all this. But he said, take the oil and gather up all of the containers that you can find. And start to pour the oil into these. And obviously we know the end of the story, which was that uh, she filled up all, the, all the, the barrels of oil from this one little cruise of oil. It's a bit like Mary Poppins' purse. You know, when Mary Poppins opens a purse and brings out all these larger than her purse items, except it's the other way around. It kept on pouring into these. She was able to sell those, pay off the debt, and rescue her children. But here's, here's the point I want to see, show you here is in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 6. Now, it came to pass when the vessels were full. Pastor Tim, I really need you to pay attention. <laughs> uh, there we go. Is there a verse up there? Next one. Is it? Oh, so the verse is not on there. Thank you for helping me. I, I, I'm, I'm going to just teach, and you help me out however you can. So, when it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is no more, there's not another vessel. And the oil stopped. You might say, well, what has that got to do anything? The oil didn't stop because it ran out. The oil stopped because there was not another container to receive it. My point being, God never runs out of His grace. God never runs out of anointing. God never runs out of creativity. God never runs out of inspiration. God doesn't run out of anything that He has. What he runs out of is people willing to receive what he is pouring out. See, the oil is always flowing, but we're not always receiving. Your willingness to receive from God releases more from God into your life. And so we have to stay in this place of willingness to embrace what he is pouring out. Sometimes you, you get under the, there's like a, a flow and an anointing in your life where you feel like, boy, it's really, this is really good. Oh, I think I'll diversify. And then you get off into something where the oil is not flowing and you go broke. If you keep on doing what you're anointed to do, you will never look back because the oil is always flowing into a receiving vessel. See, when we don't make provision for our own personal growth, when we stop learning, when we lose our willingness for God to change us, when we lose our humility to continue to receive from Him, the anointing is going to start to dry up. And so first point is God is looking for people who are willing to receive. Are you willing to receive today? Because He is pouring, but are we receiving? 
It's like people say, well, I just, don't, I just haven't heard from God lately. Well, that is a little difficult thing to embrace. Why? Because I believe God is always speaking to us. The problem is we're not always hearing. Or secondly, we're not always wanting to hear what he has to say. Because God is speaking, but sometimes we don't want to hear what God has to say. God will speak to us about something in our life, and we'll become like Jonah, and instead of really embracing, we will resist what the Holy Spirit is saying. I tell you, you want to flow in your life? You cooperate with God. You cooperate with what God is speaking to you, and he might be calling you to the precipice of another opportunity of faith, to step into the deep, into the dark, into the unknown. There is nothing more exciting than to have a blank page on the, on the history of your life, and you get to write in all the words that happen in the next chapter. Judy and I experienced that 21 years ago when we left Dallas to go to North Carolina. We, had no, we didn't know one human in Raleigh. We had no frame of reference. We had no reason to leave here. And out of the will of, outside of the will of God, we had no reason to go there. I got into the truck and we were sitting outside of the front of Covenant Church. We'd been there 11 and a half years, seen it grow from 300 to 6,000. And we were glad to be part of the journey at that season of our life. And I was in the lead truck. Judy was behind me. Rhonda Cato was tagging along, was following us. Barbara Perez, Frank Perez in his truck, and I was the head of the pack. I'll never, never forget, after we prayed with Jerry and Sharon Parsons and a few staff in the foyer, got into the trucks to head out to North Carolina, turned on the engine, and, and I had to kind of turn left to, towards Trinity Mills and then turn right on Trinity Mills to go the tollway, and I looked over my shoulder and you know how sometimes an emotion hits you and you go, <laughs> like you're about to cry, but you kind of catch it because you're a man? <laughs> Not just a man, a manly man. <laughs> and I had, I had this <laughs> of emotion because the co convoy was like a weird kind of Z, Z. And all of these people were following me. And I had no idea where I was going. <laughs> And this was a, and I looked at my kids and I said, I had two of them with me, of the three. And I said, God has given us a blank page in the story of our life. We're going to a new city to live in a new house for you to start, go to a new school, for you to get new friends, to start a new church. I said, it's a complete blank page and God's going to write something fantastic. Oh, if you haven't done it one time in your life, you need to put it all into the middle of the table and say, Lord, I, I want to be a receiver of what you're pouring out to take me to the next level of my life. You know what I'm saying? All right. The, the second story I want to talk about is the fish that would not stop flying. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus had got into Peter's boat, had to push away from the shore because the crowd was pressing because of him teaching and they were all into what he had to say. And so... After he had taught for a while, he said, let's go out into the deep. And in Luke chapter 5, if you'd like to read, follow along with me, uh, in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, uh, Simon Peter, who was an experienced fisherman, uh, kind of brought something to Jesus' attention. Because Jesus said, let's go catch fish. And Simon said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, I want to pause there for a moment because Peter could have questioned Jesus' leadership. You're, you're a carpenter, not a fisherman. Jesus, leave the fishing to me. It's amazing to me um, how many people think they know how to pastor a church. Does, does any pastors know what I'm talking about? <laughs> And uh, while we welcome people's questions and we welcome people's opinions, they have never spent one day in the shoes of a pastor to really understand what it's like to lead a ministry. I, I have a, a, a wonderful team. Um, we uh, have about 17 full-time staff. Uh, we've got about three of them still currently on Prozac, but they're doing very well otherwise. Their council is, is very proud of their progress. Um, but I was sitting with my pastoral staff, and I was kind of had, I, I, we got this enormous conference table. Um, years ago, someone said, Pastor, you need a conference table. We did. They said, well, we've got one. It ended up being like 25 or 30 feet long, has 16 high back leather chairs. It's worth $45,000, and they gave it to us for free. And now the, the, the table is full. 
And so um, now we're going to start a little child's table that we have the adults at here and any new staff can be at the kiddie table. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Um, but I was sitting at the end of the table and, and one of my pastors had ch- planted a church before and, and I was sitting at the table and I said, you know, when I was associate pastor, um, it was so different from being the senior pastor. And I just said, you know, Pastor Sean, you understand the importance of this seat. There is a difference when you sit in the senior pastor's seat than the associate pastor's seat. Um, When I was associate pastor, everyone came to me, everyone talked to me, everyone told me all the problems, all the concerns, and I would pass it on to leadership and all that. And I thought, you know, when I become a senior pastor, I'm going to be so loved and liked by everyone. They're just going to care about me, love me, embrace me. No one tells me nothing. They don't tell me one thing. They go to my associates and tell them. They never come. Do you you have that experience or or, or are your people a little more, well, they are Texans? They're perfect. perfect. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I can tell you what I meant to say about that is, first of all, pray for your pastors, (laughs) number one. But also stay in your lane. Don't try to pastor something. Don't try not to lead something you're not anointed for. You know, I think it's great to have opinions about the church, but don't go get into the wrong lane uh, of your life. And, and you pray and you support and you come alongside to help. I tell you, what I've learned, the people that grumble the most probably give the less and do the least. The people that really work hard and give, you never hear from them. Why? Because they got their nose down, tail up, working hard for the kingdom of God to push the ministry forward. Peter could have defied Jesus and settled for no harvest because he had an attitude, but he didn't. He had faith in the word of God. He had, he had to, the word of the Lord. He said, let's cast out into the deep. He said, he said, Lord, it's a wrong time of the day, but we've toiled all night. You see, but he was willing to do the extra to see what the Lord was going to do. Let me help you with something. Your next breakthrough, your miracle, your multiplication may well just be beyond your next step of faith your next inconvenience, or your next extra effort. God has arranged it that the things he has for you are slightly out of reach where you have to breach it the distance by faith to grab what God has for you. It's not going to come to you just because you show up at church. It's not going to come to you just because you read your Bible and try to be diligent to pray. It's going to come to you that in spite of what the Lord has said, even though it might defy logic, or your common sense, or anything that you think may be the perimeters of wisdom, when the Lord speaks something. How, how do you think Moses and the children of Israel felt? The, the, the armies of Israel behind them, this big body of water in the front of them, and they, the, the Pharaoh was bearing down, and, and, and the Lord said, uh, Moses said to the Lord, Lord, what do I want me to do? He says, take your rod. Do you have a rod? Yes, I have a rod. Take the rod. Yes, Lord, I'll take the rod. And I will beat the Philistines. No, hold it over the water. Uh Uh-huh. Is that it? Is that the plan of our deliverance? But see, here's the wonderful thing about God. He will use anybody with anything. He could have said to Moses, Moses, grab that chicken. Hold it in your hand. And hold it over the water. And everyone's like, what is he doing with that chicken? It happened to be a rod. What has God put in your hand that he is about to use? What God is speaking to you might defy logic, but is that there's something just out of reach that he's wanting you to reach for. And in this moment of expression of faith, Peter had to step across the chasm of his logic to do something that seemed out of order or seemed really, really strange to him. And he said this, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my net. Some of you are going to be saying this to the Lord this week. What I'm feeling is birthing in me is going to require me to say, nevertheless, at thy word. Just like Jesus had to pray it. Nevertheless, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. I don't, nevertheless. And sometimes you come to a nevertheless moment that you have to say, God is speaking, and he's wanting me to breach my unbelief 
with faith, step over my unbelief to embrace what God has for me. And he said, nevertheless, at thy word, uh, we will let down the net. And when they had done this, look at this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat, come and help them. And they come and filled both boats so they began to sink. Peter's obedience led to an abundant increase. An abundant increase led to his generosity. You see, he could have had all those fish in his boat for himself. But his instant response was, I'm going to bring the other guys in this to, with me. And their solution to catching more fish was obedient generosity. It was to be obedient and to be generous at the same time. Therefore, their harvest was not limited by the number of fish that were coming in, but rather by the number of boats they had to hold the fish. If they had more boats, there would have been more harvest. They could have kept the harvest for themselves, but their willingness to share the harvest increased their capacity, causing extreme multiplication that took place. Your willingness to receive from the Lord, your willingness to be obedient to His Word, is going to release something in your spirit that is going to be incalculable for you. Now, the third one is the blessing that just kept coming. In the Old Testament, we see where Solomon was commissioned to build what his father was not able to, the house of the Lord. He built the house of the Lord. Dedication time came, and, and so it was complete. And his requirement was to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And so he did. But he decided, you know, God is worthy of more than just one sacrifice. And he offered a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord. He didn't have to. But that was rather extreme giving, was it not? <laughs> Aren't you, don't you want to be one of those givers? Yeah, I could give a thousand, but Lord, I think I'll give a hundred thousand. And maybe if someone wants to do that right now, and we're willing to wait all day for you to come forward right now with that gift. And just release your face, step across the breach, glory to his name. But after he sacrificed a thousand bullets... That night the Lord came to him to ask him what he wanted. First um, uh, Kings chapter 3 verse 4. Now when the king uh, uh, went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, there was a great high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. And, and the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night saying, Ask, what shall I give you? But down in verse 9. Therefore, because he, uh, he said, therefore give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I might discern between good and evil. And I want, I want to read this because I, I want you to hear this in your spirit. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have you asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked life for the life of your enemies. <laughs> okay. When was the last time some of your prayers did not include that list? Lord, I pray you bring judgment on that neighbor. He stole my rake again, and I want it. Lord, I pray you convict. Or that it's all about you and you getting more money. Lord, I need more money. I just need more money. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting how he prayed and what the response was. But don't let me get sidetracked. And he said, because you have not prayed for this, but you asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I done according to your word. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that, you, uh, so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall there be any arise after you. And I also have given you what you have not asked, riches and honor. Here's the whole point. Solomon sacrificed much, asked little, but got more than he asked for. However, many Christians today give little to nothing, yet ask God for everything. Click that again, should be enough. We, we ask for everything. We get, don't get involved, we hardly give, we, we tip more than tithe. We just kind of come in on Sunday, show up, do our North Texas Christian thing, ease in, ease out. Let's see what Holland's got for us today. 
See if it's going to really fit what I'm, where I'm at right now. If it's not a good word, that's okay. I've got 10,000 other churches to be un- uncommitted to. <laughs> you see, sometimes we want all that God has for us, but we're not willing to pay the price for what it's going to take to get it. Solomon just had to give one sacrifice, and he gave a 1,000. And the Lord shows up and says, what is it that I can give you? And he didn't ask for himself except to have wisdom, Lord, to lead these people. And so he got that, but he also got what he didn't ask for. That is extreme multiplication in Solomon's life. He became the wealthiest man. His wealth was mind-boggling. In our economics, it was mind-boggling. But you see, a lot of Christians give little to nothing, but they come asking for everything. And then they stomp their foot like a spoiled child when they don't get it. And yet they don't understand that the, the blessing of the Lord and the multiplication of God in your life is oftentimes the result of how much you're willing to sacrifice. And you may look at some people, they, some people in ministry and in business, they have a poverty mentality. Others have a greed mentality. You know there is actually a, a happy medium between both, right? There is a place where you can walk as a believer and be anticipating the blessing of the Lord because your mind has been renewed to the Word of God that it's not about you, your wealth, your comfort, and how much you're going to stack up and have, but it's about how many people you can touch and how many lives can be changed through the, through the creativity and the economics that can be created in your life. But you, you give, the Scripture says, give to God and it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men pour back into you. When you put yourself in a position of submission to God, He will release the favor of God through men that will bless your life exponentially. I I got this word in my spirit for maybe one or two people, maybe ten people here today. God has you on the brink of something, and He's going to move you past average and mediocrity and status quo, and you're done with it. You're ready to move past it, but it's going to cost you more than what it's taken to get you where you are right now. To move beyond because the kingdom of God is progressive. I will live. I will multiply. I will go in and I will possess. The kingdom of God is about possession. Not possessions, but possession. Of the realm where you are gifted. Why are we slaves to the ungodly who have the loudest voices in culture? When it should be the Christians who are the leaders, the market trenders, they should be the ones who are leading the pack in every sphere of life and culture. Sorry, am I yelling? I I apologize, I'm just passionate. (laughs) All right. For God to bring extreme multiplication to us, we have to be willing to refocus our lives from being about us to being about others. And the only way to make room for more is to release or to give what we already have. And that may be your talent, your time, it may be your treasure, but your love, whatsoever man sows, you sow love, you will reap love. Because it's not about performance, it's about obedience. If you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you're stuck, it's time to do something different. Here's my last point today. Are you settling or are you subduing? In the story of uh, King Josiah in 2 Kings 13, the, uh, the, the Elisha the prophet said to him, because there was uh, attacks against him, the Syrians were coming against him, and he wanted to get victory over them. And he said, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped and the man of God was angry with him and said you should have struck five or six times when and then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it but now you will strike Syria only three times why do we settle for less when God's given us grace for more. Not more about greed, more about victory. You see, the the man had the opportunity to strike the ground, but he didn't realize that it was a prophetic striking. 
But God brings you to moments in your life and he challenges to this. Uh, are you going to settle where you are? Are you going to say, this is okay and this is enough? Or is there something in you that now it won't be necessarily striking the ground, but it'll be taking some sort of step of faith that's going to challenge you to move in a direction where multiplication can start to happen in your life because lives are dependent on your success. The kingdom of God is dependent on the fact of who your life will impact and who your life will touch. We must fight the desire to just settle. You see, there's something in our human nature that has the propensity to be happy with less than your full potential can achieve. When we settle, it is never settling for more. It is usually settling for less. Yeah, we never settle up. Where do we, what do we do? We normally settle down. Kids, just settle down, will you? Look, just settle down. And we settle, we get married, and we settle down with our wife and children, and we settle down with what we have, and we settle down. And after a while, the enemy has just got us into this mindset of that down is, is like the opposite of up. Now, I understand that there's a principle that, that the way up is to go down, the way to live is to die, I understand. But flow with me in this thought that we are oftentimes mentally settling down when God is actually wanting us to settle up. He wants to elevate your thinking and elevate your faith. And part of the purpose of this church, of this ministry, of this house, of, of what is happening in this place is to energize your life to another place of personal release so you can have the satisfaction of accomplishing the very reason why you were created. You're not here to take up space. It's like the little boy got a message home from his teacher and to his parents. And they opened up and they said, we didn't know Johnny had such an interest in aeronautics. He said, oh, that's good. Then the teacher wrote, all he's doing here is taking up space. And, and you can't just come and take up space. You've got to come and say, Lord, why have I been created? What am I here for? Uh, a woman who's a member of our church, or was a member for many years, and, and then business took her to Atlanta. Uh, she's from Nigeria, and uh, we called her our Nigerian queen. Actually, she's a princess. Uh, her father was a king of, a, of, of an area there. And... Um, She's in, in technology, and uh, she had a passion for the kingdom of God. And she said, Pastor, I know God has created something in me, and I believe it's going to be helpful to people. So in Nigeria, they had a, a national um, competition of, uh, in technology, and the idea was that she had was to have point-of-sale uh, possibilities that even people selling bananas off the top of their head can use their cell phone to do a transaction uh, anywhere in Africa. And so she put in her submission, and she won this whole competition. As a result of that, she's now living in Nigeria for a year because her company is exploding. They, were, they impacted 3% of Nigerians' GDP last year through their technology. You see, you can sit with average and say, you know what, God's going to use me here, he's going to use me there. Uh, God can use you in most unbelievable ways if you get yourself off of average. If you get yourself off of high center, sometimes the enemy comes to tell you how bad you are and God's busily trying to tell you for how great you are. But you're going to settle for a, a lie instead of settling up for the truth. It's time to settle up for the truth. A young man that's been one of our board members for a number of years, his, uh, his wife, uh, Judy and I, have a, the gift of collecting beauty queens. Um, we've had two Miss Americas in our church. We've had two Mrs. North Carolinas, the reigning Miss North Carolinas, a member of our church. One Miss America was with us for two years, one was with us for ten years. And Nathan and Jennifer, she was Miss America 2006. And, um, and he's always been in business, had a calling for business, been part of our church, on our, uh, one of our board members. And last January, moved to Seattle to become the, one of the new CFOs for the uh, little company called Amazon, little startup operation up there. And I said, Nathan, isn't it interesting that God has put you ne right next to the wealthiest man on the planet? I don't know what God has in mind, but God can take you from obscurity to significance in a moment of time. You're not sure about that? You just ask Joseph. Joseph woke up one day and he was a prisoner in the cell. He had gone through some ups and downs, but that's just life. You know what I'm saying? You've all had ups and downs. And you've wondered, what is my significance? Does God even know where I am? Can he even hear my voice? I can tell you, God can take you from where you are to where he wants you to be in a moment of time. Joseph woke up one morning and he was just a prisoner. And the end, by the end of that day, he was running the nation. So, oh, that's biblical. That's, God can do it in a moment. 
Uh, one of our dear friends uh, across town, um, I serve on his board, uh, Michael Gamble. Michael and Debbie Gamble were associate pastors to us in North Carolina for eight years. Then they came back to the Texas area. Now they're pastor in McKinney. I've had a young man, a, a man, he's not, I don't know how old uh, Rick Risby is, but Rick Risby is his associate pastor and has been so for the last five years. And Rick has been kind of laying low, growing strong. Rick is a motivational speaker. He, goes, he preaches the word. He travels. He's, he's, he's worked with sports teams as a motivator. And his wife gave him a word uh, recently um, that was very profound. And she said, um, the, the Lord spoke to her and said, I am about to open a window that is unrestricted in every way. This is about a month and a half, two months ago. The Lord spoke this word. The next day, they happened to look online, and there was a video that Rick, a, a portion of a, 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 a com commencement speech that Rick Rigsby had given to a, a college. Did anyone see that? Did anyone see that thing? As, okay, a few of you. Okay. She said, honey, look, there's your speech. They said, really? Is, is it online? I didn't even know anyone had it online. She said, yeah. It's got half a million views. She said, really? Oh, that's crazy. Then the next day, they looked and it said, 1.5 million views. Oh, isn't that amazing? Ready? 150 views in the last two months has launched his life in a whole nother direction. He's actually having to step down as the senior associate of the church because they've had such global exposure, over 100 phone calls a day and from Fortune 500 companies calling for him. AIG, National Insurance Company, $100 million, billion dollar company, have now signed him as their no national spokesman. A&E TV have come to sign him for a TV contract for a TV show. And he said, we are holding on because this thing has multiplied faster than... And he said, but you know what? I was dedicated and committed in the house of the Lord with a spiritual covering underneath my pastors. I was willing to serve and do whatever I want. I was praying and asking what God wanted us to do. But I was also putting out feelers. And I, was putting out, I was doing what I do, sowing seed. And God is the one that will breathe on your life and give you multiplication. You may feel like you're stuck right now, but I'm telling you, God is about to release something. You know, uh, it is, and let me finish with this. It's not that God stops feeding us. There's a little slide I have for you. It's not that God stops feeding us. It's that we just stop being hungry. It's not that God stops giving us of the Spirit. It's just that we stop being thirsty. It's not that God stops filling us. It's just that we're not empty enough of ourself. We can't, he can't fill us up with himself if we are still full of ourselves. And, I, and you're here today, and I don't know what God has in mind. I don't know how this word touches you or relates to you. But maybe there is something burning on the inside of you where you have, you're tired of the average you have been living. And fear will try and come and rob you of their existence of life. But through a Joseph or a Rick Rigsby or whomever, or, or a Nathan Gooden or who's, who's with Amazon, God can do in a moment what you think will take a lifetime. And you can suddenly have in your hands extreme multiplication that where things are multiplying and building faster than you can keep up. Go ahead and build that company. Go ahead and start that business. No more kingdom thing you can do than to employ people. Give them a job. Give them a future. Give them money so they can build their lives too. Lead them to Jesus. But empower their life. Think bigger than you've ever thought before. Please don't buy into what you hear in the news and what our world is trying to circulate by fear. Because God has been in charge way before any of us came along. It was okay back then. It's going to be okay in the future. And it's going to be okay right now in Jesus' name. Don't plan to retreat. Plan to move forward. And maybe you're here today and there's something that is in your spirit. Say, Pastor, I'm ready to move it forward in my life. And it could be one of you. It could be three of you. Would you be willing to stand right now? I just want to pray for you as I close and release my faith with you to say, Pastor, I'm believing for the next step of my life. I believe God's got something burning on the inside. I'm believing God for extreme multiplication. Not just multiplication. I'm looking for something extreme to take place. I told your pastor, I said, I'm not sure if this word is for your church or if it, it was for him. But when we were worshiping today, um, and I, just, I don't think this was just happenstance, and I was just standing there worshiping, and you know, I had my eyes open, and I saw um, a shadow on the ground. And it was someone's hands like this. And they were worshiping. Didn't have his hands open. Had their hands kind of like one hand like this and the other hand kind of like this. 
And so I looked at the shadow, and it was yours. And when I saw it, I felt like the Lord said, these hands are going to touch nations. Actually, I better back up. That's not what he said. He said, these hands are going to lift up nations. And God's got you, has a, a mark on your life. He, he's always had that. And, you know, you've, the Lord has opened up some opportunities as of late that have kind of been unique and special in some sort of ways. And when your dad was telling me about them the other day, um, I wrestled about giving this word. I went a totally different direction. I came back to it. Because I really believe that you're about to experience a season of extreme multiplication. There's going to be a multiplication outside of your control. Now, here's how the prophetic works. I may be speaking it to him, but you can receive it for you too. So I appreciate your applause, but just don't clap for him. Maybe you need to clap for yourself. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I don't know what that means or what that represents. And sometimes you felt like you've been in the shadows. But I feel like the Lord is saying it's time to come into the light. And when you come into the light, you're going to have something to say. And you're going to have a way to say it. And it's going to touch hearts and it's going to touch lives. It may not be through music, and it might be. It may be through worship, it may not be. Maybe through the word, it could be. But God's going to give you strategic liaisons and strategic connections that are going to cause your life to quickly multiply and it's going to blow your mind. And God loves to do that sort of thing. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I want you to just raise your hands to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I've tried to be obedient to what you've given me today in the simplicity of my presentation. Lord, I ask your Holy Spirit to do the work I cannot do. And that is to release in your people fresh anointing. Even those who are watching, if it is online, you receive it right now in the name of Jesus. I believe in the name of Jesus, I'm speaking to world changes. I'm, now, no, no, here's the thing. You don't have to change the whole world. You just need to change your world. You may never touch the whole world, but you are already touching your world. Lord, I believe that these are world changes. And Father, that even this week, there will be a rebirth of creative ideas that we will baptize into your wisdom and that you will breathe on by your spirit and you will give multiplication and you will give increase beyond our human understanding. We call it as so and say it's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good hand clap today. right now. Come on, lift up your voice and let's declare it right now. Let the heavens open. Let your kingdom move. All our faith and hope. Let faith arise in this place this morning. God, we claim your word over our lives right now over every family in this room, over every business, over every creative idea, over our church, God, over DFW, we declare, let the heavens open. Multiplication right now in Jesus' name. We believe it this morning, God. Say that part one more time. No heaven locked up, let it open. No kingdom stand still, let it move. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God, our great God. All our heart this morning. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God. Does anybody believe that this morning? 
multiplication, extreme multiplication, not just any kind of multiplication, extreme multiplication in Jesus' name. We declare it, we receive it right now in Jesus' name. God, we receive your word. We ask God that it would be fulfilled in our lives. Not in 10 years, not in five years, not next year, but God, let us enter that season right now in Jesus' name. Let us walk through that door right now. Let those windows be opened up right now in this moment, God. Let faith arise in this room. Let faith arise in this room in Jesus' name. We believe your word, God. We stand on your promises in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Pastors Linton and Judy, thank you so much for this word, for your spirit, for what God has spoken in you and through you and to us. And we receive it with open arms today. And may God bless everything that he's doing in you guys and through you guys. And bless Raleigh, North Carolina in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody grateful for the word that we received this morning in Pastors Linton and Judy? Amen.